nothing more meaningful that you can do than to commit yourself to helping to develop the life of somebody else. Somebody who looks like you, who comes from the communities that you come from. If for no other reason that they have the chance to sit in a room just like this and dream dreams just like you. I'll give you some history. Lyndon B. Johnson in the 1950s was a teacher in a little town car called Catulo, Texas. It's filled with Mexican-American students and they were impoverished. That experience led him into ESEA, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Ed Education Act. And when he started that, he had two things in mind. Number one, there has to be federal funding for education. That was the first time the federal government gave money to schools. Number two, for ESEA, the federal government cannot establish a national curriculum, cannot do it. Now with those two things in place, he started standardized testing as to see where the kids are. And that's when the achievement gap was first uncovered. We say race matters. We look at historical um, uh, evidence of students not being um, allowed to participate in certain things like advanced placement classes or honors classes. So um, again, not overt racism, uh, individualized, but there are certain um, uh, barriers that are often put up, um, not consciously to keep a group of kids out, but often that's the result of, of a policy or a practice. Um, we also know, uh, especially right now in 2014, uh, we've had two terms of an uh, African-American president in the United States, and so much of the world feels like we're in a post-racial society, that somehow we've um, nipped this racism thing in the bud, and that's not the case. If it were the case, we would have uh, proportionate numbers of students of color um, graduating students of color going on to college, persisting and graduating from college. So there's ample evidence that racism um, impacts how our kids, and they tell us. Um, a lot of our students tell us that's what happens. There weren't really any support systems for minorities uh, at my high school. It was kind of more of a fend for yourself type thing where you had, uh, it was your choice to like pull yourself up by the bootstraps and like, um, go above and beyond what was expected of you because um, through my experience in high school I realized that in certain words like not much was expected of the minority students like they expected you to be in like gen ed classes like just the regular classes or even possibly in like remedial classes and so when you were in an honors class or in an AP class you were looked at as like oh my god look at this special snowflake black person who's in this class. Um, I used to get those comments a lot, actually. Like, looking back at it, during that time, I didn't really see it as, like, bad. But, like, after I graduated and I've had more experiences with um, people, it was kind of insulting in a way, where they would be like, oh, you're not like the rest of those black people. I'm like, what does that mean? What type of comment is that? Or I'd get comments like, um, like, after I took the SAT, we were discussing SAT scores, and I told a couple of my friends who were in, like, my AP class, which is mostly um, Asians and um, Caucasians. I told them my SAT score, they were like, oh my God, that's like getting a 2400 for a black person. Like, that's really great. I was just like, um, okay, that's, that's a bit on the insulting side that you didn't expect me to do really well on an SAT based on what my skin color, but um, that's a whole nother topic. It's that mindset that, you know, makes me, you know, who I am and makes me push to ignore all these other distractions. Cause as far as I'm concerned, they're distractions. They don't they, like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't worry why someone thinks that I'm only going to be, you know, a worker at, you know, McDonald's. And it was funny. There's a typical 
typical example was, you know, while I was still in school, I had this one math, math teacher, and it was for pre-calculus. And he told me, like, and it wasn't that I was bad at pre-calculus. Obviously, I'm an engineer. Like, in mathematics is something that I have to like in order to be a, any type of engineer. He told me that I wasn't going to be successful because I couldn't understand the basics of, you know, what pre-calculus was. Mind you, I got an A in differential equations in, in college. You need Calc 1, Calc 2, Pre-Calc, whatever type of mathematics out there in order to, to, to get an A. Like it, it, to Having, and I guess an A shows that you have very good understanding of the material. And I just remember just thinking back to that point in time when he told me that I wasn't going to do well or that I wasn't going to be able to understand you know, my academics. And I just laughed because he told me that. And I said, what you said doesn't really exist in my world. What, what does it mean not to do well? I don't know what that means. It's not in my vocabulary. All I have to do is try and try and try again. And if I can't, if I fail, that's great, you know, because I could wake up tomorrow, pick up my textbook and start reading it all over again and try again. are coming together to work together to, to put their minds together um, again that, that has a, an academic piece um, of people sharing information sharing knowledge but I think it has uh, that emotional piece where you, you feel like you're not alone that you there are others addressing the same issue having the same struggles experiencing what you are experiencing and again whether when I say you whether that's a student a teacher a principal a school district um, to know that there are others with that same belief, the same passion, same knowledge, sharing that knowledge and sharing those, uh, those stories with each other I think brings strength to the, to the effort. In our middle school program we had three levels of math. So students coming from the fifth grade into sixth grade, there were three levels that they might get placed in based on their math abilities from fifth grade. So as a fifth grader, young students are really looking at computation and um, that might not be a great predictor for algebra, for example. So in sixth grade, we had students who were basically on a track to take algebra or not. And that was something that I was very concerned about at the time as I was the math supervisor then. And um, so the tracking sort of put kids on a path that they really couldn't easily get off of. So by changing the, the course structure, we brought kids into a track or a pathway that got them to Algebra 1 by 8th grade. So our goal was for all students to be able to have access to Algebra 1 by the end of 8th grade. Ever since I was young, you know, there are people who say, oh, you can't come to my party because you're black, you're black, this and that. Black people should do this, black people are expected to. And it's hard to know what to do with all those stereotypes, like where you see yourself fitting in um, in society when people tell you those things. And I guess Amazon has really helped me think more deeply about that and where I fit in in social situations and just, yeah, just how I can relate to other people and myself about race. You know, we have the, the far radical polls. So one is saying, the, the, one of the polls that I, as I hear in academia is, well, let's get rid of poverty. Well, poverty is something that's going to take a long time to, to get rid of. It started with Lyndon B. Johnson, War on Poverty, and how he started with the ESEA Act, the Edu Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And he waged war on poverty. We are still waging war on poverty. Getting rid of poverty is a noble cause, a noble endeavor, but it takes time. We have to do something now to bridge the achievement gap. You have the responsibility of answering the call, the call to be better, to be more, to disrupt the status quo and literally change the world we live in, or at least the way that we think about it.